I'm going to share with us today is more like an exhortation, really. Uh, it's a spin-off from what we shared last week on times and seasons. It's like a tutorial on that, in the sense that this is it's, it's a review, something we've preached before, but it uh, has present prophetic relevance because of the time we're living in. We shared last week that we're in the time and the seasons of the Feast of Tabernacles, and we're in the last phase. The Feast of Tabernacles has three, had three um, sections, the blowing of trumpets, which began about 1900, it gathered Israel, natural Israel, gathered the Pentecostals, voice of healings, you know, spearheaded by Gordon Lindsay and others, gathered the kingdom people, the latter rain people like George Warnock. George Warnock wrote Feast of Tabernacles in 1951. They could see But isn't it amazing, Pastor G? It was about exactly the same time Jesus appeared to Kenneth Hagin. See, God was bringing the truth into the church in diverse ways because the season had changed. So the revelation that has come the last 50, the last 50 years, slightly over 50 years, from 1950 about 2000 all that was supposed to allow the church to come into cleansing perfection which is the um, substance of the day of atonement the day of atonement was the day in which the sin was covered then you know and that's been fulfilled and we thank god for it the last portion is the time we're living in now the feast of tabernacles and the feast of tabernacles had two main there are a lot of things we could <laughs> talk about, but two outstanding um, features. The first one was that it represented, it represents the perfection of the fruit of the Spirit in the church, which is perfection of love, which is what we've been emphasizing, and particularly in this house, God has had mercy on us. I've been emphasizing this now for really about 10 years, 2003. As I teach in that, keeping yourself in the love of God. I mean, we've always preached love, you know, right from the beginning of this ministry. Go, go and check out any of my books. You find the love of God is cardinal, but with greater emphasis and uh, on one hand. And then the second hand is to, the second feature is to harvest the nations. So there's a harvest of the fruit of the Spirit in the church, which will now result in the harvest of the nations and we saw this last week where we have to disciple the nations what that means practically literally is to have a perfect church in every tribe from and kindred that's what it means that is you can't water it down because he said teach them all all so it's not it's not it's not you know he didn't say teach them the fundamentals <laughs> you know and the apostle paul said let us go on to perfection So we can't just teach them healing and deliverance and prosperity and stop there. No, we've got to move on. And this is where this message comes in now. That I call it an exhortation, really. You know, it will go through tribulation. You've got to know that. The voyage is fraught with much danger. But you see, that's why I want to share. So I've been titled this Overcoming Tribulation. Simple, that's very simple. You can't wish tribulation away, especially if you're going into perfection. Amen. The day, and I don't want to frighten you, but I just want to give you the reality. The day you made up your mind that you were going to grow into perfection, you became a special target for Satan. Satan doesn't, he's not, in, he's not too interested in other Christians. 
Satan will take off troops from other places and divert them directly to you. Hello. Now, I know that ordinarily will make people afraid, but don't be afraid. I like the way Jesus said, and I'll start from there. It's in John 16, 33. He says, in the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I like Jesus. Be of good cheer. Don't you have a mouth? I said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're going to have tribulation, all right. The Bible says, through much tribulation, not little, much, we're going to enter the kingdom. And believe you me, I'm going to the kingdom. So I'm going through the much tribulation. And I'm of good cheer. Because uh, Jesus is with me. And I will overcome the tribulation. Give the Lord a clap offering somebody. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's the essence of this prophetic teaching and exhortation. Is to prepare us. So you will know what to do. Good soldiers. You know, all these guys, the, the seals. They are given special training. Special. They're, they're, they're taken, they're, they're extracted from the normal troops. We call them el elite troops. Special forces. But, with the extra training comes extra problem. That's what's happening to us spiritually. You have to understand it. You know, and I want you to be encouraged. So be of good cheer. So, but it's, it, it's, it's, and, and, and I want to tell you, I'm going to tell you why. I'm telling you what it is. And I'm going to tell you why. And I'm going to tell you how to handle it. So that when it hits, your training will take over. There's something about training. When you've trained on something and trained on it and trained on it and trained on it and trained on it. When you are in an emergency, the training kicks in. Not emotion, Amen. not fear, is what has been, what has been uh, um, 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 imbibed and, and, and ingrained. And that's what that guy, you know, I read a book of one of these um, um, uh, seals, one of the guys who took out Bin Laden. He said, when, when after, you know, after they've trained them and trained them and trained them, he said, you, um, you act almost automatically. They sleep almost with one eye open. When they hear anything, all the trading comes in. They know exactly how to roll, how to put their gun, you know, in the right place. They, they know, you know, it's because they've been, you have to be like that now. When tribulation hits, it's coming. Believe me, I'm a true prophet. <laughs> I'm a false prophet. It's coming. But the, 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 the problem is not the tribulation, really. The problem is you. <laughs> And how you handle it when it comes. And that's why I'm teaching you. So, what is tribulation? Let's quickly just define it. It simply is bodily or circumstantial attack. Or you can call it affliction. as another word for it. You know, where your circumstances uh, and your, uh, sometimes your physical body. may not necessarily be sickness. Sometimes, you know, just hitting against you. For example, what happened with Paul on that ship was a, a tribulation. Do you understand? The ship was attacked. Their physical bodies were afflicted. Can you imagine going for food without for 14 days? You know, the whole, the whole physical circumstance. That's what a tribulation is. It's, tribulation is a composite word. It, 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 it connotes, you know, uh, physical, circumstantial, bodily, mental, emotional affliction. Anything that's just attacking you and wants to, you know, stop you. That's what it is. Now, this is a question many Christians have asked over the years. I used to ask it. I asked it many years ago, and God gave me the answer through the Bible. I used to wonder why. Why? God, you're powerful. How can you let this guy just be afflicting us anyhow? In fact, there I read that scripture. I said, through much of it, I said, ah, ah, well, you wouldn't have said through little. Hey, God. <laughs> uh, why much? Uh, why do you say through no tribulation? <laughs> that would have been a nicer scripture. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, it's a question, it's a, it's a, it's a question that's rang down through the ages. Why does God allow Satan, let's just put it this way, why does God allow Satan to attack us? 
Let, let's, let's stretch that question a little bit. Why does God even allow Satan to kill Christians? His own people. He does. How many people know that? Kills Christians. And Satan cut off the head of a prophet. A whole John the Baptist. Cut his head off. A whole prophet. A prophet, Jesus said, a greater prophet than John has not arisen as born of women. The devil cut his head off. Huh? And you know what? God sat in heaven and watched. You would have thought, like Naaman, he said, I thought the prophet would come out and call upon his God, and some lightning would have fallen from heaven and recovered the leper. That's what you get for thinking about God without knowing about God. And that's why you should go and find out what the Bible says, not what you think. God doesn't do what you think. God does what he said. Hello, somebody. Are you listening to me? Ah, you know, thought, you know, thought, you know, thought, but God didn't do that. Ah, I was like, ah, you, you, why, why, why didn't, hey, hey, chill, guys. We all see the acts of the apostles. Remember, they had Peter inside the jail. And an angel came in the middle of the night. I remember, remember that? And, 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 and kicked Peter. <laughs> and Peter got up in the middle of the night. And the angel took him. And the, and the prison door was just opening and opening. Why didn't do that for John the Baptist? Why didn't an angel say, ah, same God? Why didn't, say, why didn't an angel just come from heaven? You know, kick the door of the jail open in the middle of the night? And bring John the Baptist out. The questions that are always in the minds of Christians. Some of them are unsaid. But I want to tell you the answer. And the answer I'm going to give you is an is answer of principle. Details will vary from person to person, from situation to situation. But the principles do not change. I said this about the Lord Jesus a few weeks ago. And I'm going to repeat it. Jesus was never presumptuous. Never. Jesus, that's why you think it worked for Jesus. So when Jesus was a baby, remember when he wanted to kill him, the, the, the God appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, get the child out. Yeah. Why did he just station Gabriel, Michael, and about um, three or four thousand archangels around our house in Bethlehem and say, we want to see the devil who's going to come here and kill him. Now that I've been a great show of power. Hello. After all, it was an angel that appeared to tell Mary. Why didn't I say angel? You know, and then when he was born in Bethlehem, it was a throng of angels that appeared to the shepherds at night. Why didn't I say throng of angels just come down to Bethlehem and say, we dare you. Enter this house, you see Pepe. You know why? God's not like that. God's not spooky. Everybody say, God's not spooky. God works on principles, not emotions. It takes spiritual power through prayer to release those amount of angels and get them functioning. Mary didn't have it. Joseph didn't have it. Get the child out. This is what will work for you. Take the child to Egypt. Keep him there until when I tell you to bring him back. That's what will work for you at your level. You can't handle staying in Jerusalem. They'll kill the child. Bottom line. Bottom line. We have to understand God works through him. He doesn't do things outside his word. It took the intercession of Simeon and Anna over 60 years. 60 years of daily prayer in the temple to birth the Christ. There's nothing wrong with Moses, Joseph, and Mary. They were nice people, but they didn't have that level of spirituality. 
they didn't. They were chosen to be the vessels through which he would come. No, lots, lots of stuff were being told. It was flying over their heads. They didn't have a clue what was going on. Simeon and Anna had more revelation about what was happening than Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph were just looking. He said, Mary pondered these things in her heart. Joseph was a nice man, good man, upright man, you know, morally upright, but he, he didn't make it. God will, is able to operate within the scope and the um, um, latitude, if I can use that expression, of the space, spiritual space that he's given to operate in. He can't, he, now nah, he does a few things sovereignly, but even that has to be paid sometime. So he's careful about that because he watches his budget. Praise the Lord. Hello? Hello? If you don't understand it, you won't understand the Bible. And then you, you, when you understand this, by the mercy and the grace of God, because I've understood it more than I did some years ago, it makes you not presumptuous at all. It makes you diligent. It makes you careful. It makes you like Jesus. He walked no longer in jury. Jesus didn't waste power. He conserved what he had. When there's no need, when there is no need to expose myself, why? Power that could be conserved and used for something else that's more important? That I could avoid by simply not walking in jury? That's why. Now, let me give you the principle. You find the principle here in Second uh, Thessalonians chapter 1. Lord, have mercy. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. And uh, let's look at verses 4 through 6. Now, very great truth, Paul, by the Spirit of God, is revealing to us through the churches at Thessalonica. So that we ourselves, read along with me, glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith, in all your persecutions and what? Tribulations that you endure. Next verse. Quitch. This is a great truth. Grab it. Quitch is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Next verse. That's the punchline. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to what? Recomp ever say recompense. Say payback. Recompense. Tribulation to them that trouble you. If they don't trouble you, God has no legal basis to recompense. Watch this. The sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ was the legal basis for our redemption. Our sufferings is going to be the legal base for the eternal banishment and punishment of Satan and his folks. That is why we must be allowed to be attacked. If Satan doesn't attack us, he's not culpable in the court of law. Satan and his folks, if they don't attack us and they don't even kill some of us, on what legal basis will God have to punish them? Because they didn't attack. That is why the enemy must always be allowed to come in. 
It's a legal thing. You have to understand it. And unfortunately, no, I don't believe in the word fortune. You know, <laughs> it's not even sad. And providentially, because it's God who provides it. <laughs> Amen. You're the bait. <laughs> but the good news is, the good news is, you know, God will never allow you. Never. He will never allow you to be devoured by the enemy if you stay within the confines of what he's told you to do. The enemy shall come in like a flood. But the spirit of God, glory to God, will raise a standard against him. And what does the standard do? It overcomes the flood. Praise the Lord. Let's put another one. Beautiful scripture. It's in Isaiah 43. You will pass through the fire, but it will not kindle upon thee. Now, you will pass through. You will pass through the waters, but they will not overflow you. But you will pass through. Is this clear? You have to understand so that you can cooperate intelligently with God. And when things are happening, you don't start fighting with God and getting angry. God, why you allow this to happen to me? You have to understand that you, 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 you made a covenant with God. That, Lord, we are going to do this kingdom thing. And we are going to deal with all these rebels. And God said, fine. But I, let you know, I, let, I need to let you understand that, therefore, I'm going to allow them to attack you. Through much tribulation. But I give you my word that if you will, as you walk with me, I will defend you and I'll help you to overcome it. But when they attack you, then you will give me the legal basis to deal with them. So let's start. Is it clear? Get it. It has to be ingrained. Get it deep inside. <clears throat> that's why, in principle, that's the reason why all things happen. If he's not allowed to enter, and he's not allowed to, you know, <coughs> uh, you know, I watch these detective films and movies all the time, and I really enjoy a lot of them, because, you know, it's amazing. I, I like watching the true life ones. I don't like just the fiction ones, you know, because it's real life, you know. It's amazing, you know, many times how uh, either FBI or CIA or NCIS, you know, the way they, they call them sting operations, they will, the, the person would have brought the, he would have done, he would just, just be about to kill the person and they would just show up. But they cannot arrest him. You know what I'm He brought the gun. All the intent, in fact, in some days they even let him shoot. And the guy will have a bulletproof vest. And the bullet will come in, but he will not penetrate. You got a bulletproof vest. Glory to God. Give the Lord a clap, offering. The breastplate of righteousness. <laughs> Glory be to God. And the shield of faith. Amen. Again, quenching all the fiery doubts of the wicked, but the doubts will be thrown and they will hit the shield. Am I helping anybody? Are you following me? Amen. It is only when a person has done that and they take the pictures in a court of law. You know, all the evidence is there. He's shot with intention to kill. You know, understand? Even if, even if the subject doesn't die, because the intention to be killed has been proven beyond reasonable doubt, we can push for the death sentence. Yes. We can push for the death sentence. And in many cases, we will get it. Because we can prove, because everything about, you know, the law is an ass. With due respect to my learned friends, <laughs> and I have many of them now. Even some of my children are becoming learned friends now, so I have to be careful. Praise the Lord. With, with due respect to all my, the law is an ass. What that means is this. There is what you call the letter of the law. You see, if you can prove a thing technically, even if everybody knows it's the truth, once technically this is what the law says, the judge, the prosecutor, everybody is bound to stay by the law. So God does not want to be caught by an ass. So God allows, that's why he's giving Satan, go ahead, do it. He comes to God one day. He says, have you considered my servant Job? Job, <laughs> he's on the earth. He, does, he has no clue. Problem is about to start from him. It's conversation between God and the devil. 
He said, he said, he said, he said, where did you come from? He said, gone from going up and down throughout the folds of the earth. Ah, God said, hey, ah. Incidentally, there's a guy, oh, his name is Job. He's my covenant partner. Have you considered him? Ah, Lucifer said, oh, a Job is only serving you because you've put a shield around him and a hedge around him. I've not been able to touch him. If I touch him, he will curse you to your face. God said, eh. He said, no problem. Behold, he's in thy hand. Guess what? He'd always been in Satan's hand. Satan just never saw it. On the air has, has been, been brought to you to by Christ Life Ministries, the outreach arm of the Scripture Pastor Christian Center. You can be a part of this program by becoming a faith partner with Christ Life Ministries. For details, contact Christ Life Ministries, number 12, Oshutupu Avenue, Bodija Ibadan. You can also download our weekly messages from our website, www.spcconline.org, while our email address is scripturepastor at spcconline.org. You're welcome to worship with us at the Scripture Pastor Christian Center Auditorium, Polytechnic Road, Sango Ibadan. God bless you. Thank you.